I'm JD, the Media Jack, and this is another episode of the Flipside Podcast, episode 469, with two guests free today on this show. Before we get into that, a big thank you once again to everyone who supports me on Patreon, including the executive producer, yet again, Red Wolf Dawn. If you would like to have a shout out or be a part of the community, support everything I do here online, either through the video podcast or audio or maybe all the fun videos that I put out on YouTube, then you can support me on Patreon. The link is in the description down below, or if you're listening during the audio podcast, the link is in the description of the episode. It only costs a couple of bucks a month, and I really do appreciate it. Everything that comes from Patreon goes to this show. Speaking of the show, we're going to hear a little bit later from an incredible coach, Coach Frizzle. She is one who has an incredible story and is not shy about just being honest when it comes to health, nutrition, and fitness. And she wants to help you get to your goals and not fight against you. She wants to work with you and make things not only fun and challenging, but very rewarding. She's also kind of a big fan of cereal. There's not a sponsor, but we do hope that something maybe comes from this. If they are watching, open to suggestions. You'll find out about that a little bit later. First, a coworker of mine, a dear friend, and someone I've known for years and someone I've known of for years. In fact, I moved halfway across this province just to meet the man and to learn from him. He's an incredible radio personality, a smooth delivery, and a wonderful voice talent with an incredible sense of humor. This is a close friend of mine, ladies and gentlemen, Darren Coogan. So where I'd like to start off with is the shirt you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, some blatant product placement. Yes, huh? exactly. Yeah. This, uh, is, yeah. this is the first time that I've been a part of a station name change. Okay. Um, what about you? Um, so, yeah, uh, I've been through a few um, and also some rebrands within the same name. Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly what the first one was, but we did, like we flipped from AM to FM on in the other company. Mm-hmm. Uh, changed the name of, of that um, station a few times. Um, and then with the drive, um, you know, it's gone through a few different styles. With that, we've had to change up, uh, you know, just kind of the, the, the vibe. Um, and then this one here has been sort of the biggest one in for me, the biggest one um, uh, since coming over to Patterson, anyway. Yeah. Mm. Why is that? Probably because of the heritage of it. You know, it was like, um, what, 18 years? Yeah. You know, and uh, some of the other stations had changed um, their names as well, I believe. You know, so they're, and, you, and you, get, you get attached to something, you know, anything that you kind of put a little bit into, you get attached to it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's time, I think. I agree. Like when I came to Prince George, uh, right around the time where uh, the drive became the drive, um, like it was just the staple of of music and entertainment in my mind. I mean, yeah. back then you had, um, I think it was still ninety four X, and you had the Wolf. Yeah. Right. And you had Hits FM and then you had The Drive. And you're right, like for nearly two decades, it's everything else has changed. Yeah. But, you know, physically, like the outward outward view of The Drive was always the same. Mm -hmm. The library was adjusted over time and, of course, different staffing. And then you came on board. And then later years, I came on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, like it's been a long time coming. And, like I've been, I've been asked myself, like you know, well, what do you think? Because I, I, this is overdue, <laughs> right? Like it, I don't know if you noticed, but like the way we have changed over even the past five years that I've been on on board, yeah, things have changed. Yeah, a lot of things have changed. You know, society has changed, a, uh, you know, quite a quite a bit. Um, I think um, you know, business has changed, and and there, there's there's generally going to be. Uh, change with as decades go by but certainly as a new millennium goes by Mm -hmm. you know and so um, you know things get freshened up and from a from a marketing perspective that happens all the time Mm -hmm. that's why um, people will uh, go and and reach on the shelf for their favorite brand of whatever the product is and all of a sudden they they take a double take because they've changed the packaging a little bit right yeah you know same same kind of deal right so you you want to try to stay uh, fresh and uh, and relevant and um, 
I, th- I think I think we do that. I hope so. Anyway, yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the worst person to ask. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, but go ahead and try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've I've worked for three different stations uh, in my career of choice, of course, being radio. Yeah. And I've gone through drastic changes of those three. The first one was talk radio, mm-hmm. and then I went to oldies. And then I came mm. to the drive, which was classic hits, classic rock. Yeah, um, I, I found or what some people might these days call oldies. <laughs> 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 yeah, then, then what does that put the category of my second station? Um, golden oldies, I guess. But yeah. um, for me, transitioning from from the talk to to the oldies, like the boomer radio station, wasn't as difficult as it was for me transitioning from the boomer station to where we are mm, yeah okay for you though like you've like you've transitioned to different stations in different formats way more than me yeah well that that would be the extra 20 years on you, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but but always in well other than smithers like i started in smithers and i came to prince george and and so it, most of my moves have been in, in prince george right? right right um and uh you know a couple with the other company which is now vista and um, so, you know, I, I was hired on the country station. I went over to the rock station, and then I ended up going back to the country station. And then, um, so, the, you know, there was some bouncing around in there, and then, and then it bounced over to Patterson. So it's always, you know, it's, it's the thing about going from one thing to the other, though, is not necessarily, um, you know, maybe the music might change or the style might change, but, I mean, you're, you're talking with somebody. Yeah. Right and and whatever's around you is what's around you. Yeah. Um, so whatever the music is, whether it's country or rock or classic hits or whatever, mm-hmm. um, that's what's that's the environment in which you're having a conversation with somebody. Um, but what's more important, I suppose, would be the the conversation. Yeah. So, um, but mind you, um, when you when you did talk radio and what you're doing now, it gives you the chance to uh, to talk a lot more. <laughs> and, and sometimes we, um, you know, sure, we we like to talk a little bit. So this is a nice way for you to uh, to have a little of a expanded version of yourself. I, well, I yeah, this this is why I, I do it because mm-hmm. when I initially when I started off, I I knew I wanted to be in radio. I never considered talk radio to be in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. And then I got my first job, which was talk radio, and I instantly fell in love with it. Yeah, because. Play, for me, yeah, playing music is great, mm-hmm. but I realized then that telling stories and listening to stories and just back and forth and the conversation was, to me, way more captivating. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, you also are a very social guy. Uh, some, what, some might argue. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me rephrase that. Mm. You are a socially comfortable guy. This is true. So you can you can go into different situations, um, in a, in a number of different worlds, mm-hmm. whether it be in um, in a media sense or um, a blue collar sense, yeah. um, with uh, buses and and driving truck and, and that kind of stuff, and um, and also from from your background in the gaming world as well, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're able to draw upon a lot of these different things to to uh, to bring to a conversation, whether it's behind a microphone or if it's just anywhere. Yeah. Right. For you, for you, that's a that's a that's a skill. So um, yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me that uh, you kind of were interested in in uh, and enjoyed the whole talk radio world. <laughs> and while you're doing this. Yeah. Well. Th- uh, yeah. This is my outlet now, right? Yeah. And like I love doing it. Um, One question before you move on. Yeah. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear my slurping? <laughs> <laughs> no. Because you no. Know, seriously. Because I. I <laughs> Because because I, I want to know like like if, if 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 you if you weren't getting that then I'll just sit here and slurp away but then I don't want you to go you know when you're editing this go fucking good yeah. <laughs> all it's, he did was slurp all the way through the interview fine all it's right? fine you're not the first person to consume as I'm having a conversation okay about we'll this. check on we'll we'll check on the gargling <laughs> protocol a little bit later on exactly okay. I believe it's called mukbang online. Mukbang. <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do at a young age, and that was fortunate for me because it gave me a direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and in our last conversation, although years ago, I'll, I'll quickly recap, um, 
my father brought home one of those Fisher Price microphones that you can hook up and and wire or like like through signals hook up to your home stereo and then oh, yeah yeah okay and that's where I fell in love with the idea of being on a radio as when I was a child and I just have taken steps through there um, and you know my job back in Vancouver and then I got to meet a mutual friend of ours Todd Hancock and he's the one who said if you want to take things seriously find Darren Coogan mm. right but he was playing a wicked, <laughs> wicked joke on you man it, it, it could have been just like get the fuck out I'm, of my house I'm gonna, send, I'm gonna send this guy to northern BC <laughs> but he'll go with a joyful spirit and a, and a lovingness in his soul hopefully hopefully he'll <laughs> hopeful. be hopeful um, but um I'm not sure if we really got into it. Like, why did you get into broadcast? Why did you get into radio? You know what? Uh, I was always a fan of radio mm -hmm. um, from a young age through my teens. Um, you know, I got locked into music and concerts and things like that with C Fox in Vancouver and KSW and um, and KXRX in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, I remember lying on the couch in grade 12 or something. I had like this awesome um, semester where I only had three classes. Started at like 9.30 and I was done by 1.30. And I would sit on the on the couch and lie back with dad's old cans on. Yeah, yeah. And listen to uh, Crow and West in, in uh, Seattle. Uh, Gary Crow and Mike West. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love listening to those guys. And so it, that's when I've really sort of started to kind of get a little bit of... Um, an interest in in radio right mm -hmm. i still at that point didn't really think of it in terms of a career it was more so a, a passion at that point point. and so i was curious as to what the inside of a radio station looked like and um still at this point um maybe thinking about um what it would be like to be on on air uh but not really thinking that it was within reach or anything mm-hmm so I phoned up. Um, oh no, I went. I, I so I just stopped. I dropped by C Fox in Vancouver, and asked for a tour. And uh, the receptionist uh, sent me into the um, GM's office. I think it was Alden Deal, and he said, "So you'd like to see the station?" I said, "Yeah, yeah. I'm you know I'm kind of interested in radio and whatnot. I'd love to go for a tour. I don't know if you do that kind of thing, but if if that was possible, that'd be great." And he said, "Well, if you're interested in radio, then take one night course at BCIT." When you finish that course, come back and I'll I'll set up a tour for you for the station. That's that's an awfully big ask. It it, it was kind of, and I, I I don't know maybe maybe that week they had a whole bunch of people just walk off the street looking for tours. <laughs> he thought I'm going to send this guy packing, <laughs> and so I did, and I took a course in um, yeah, just like introduction to broadcasting course at BCIT. Mm. Yeah, Mike Lean from CTV. Mm -hmm. He was the instructor along with his dad who was a big voiceover guy. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and then I finished it and I went back down to C Fox and, uh, and got back in front of the GM and I said, hey, remember me? You told me to go and take a course and I'm here for my tour. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> looking at me stunned like. He did it. <laughs> he, well, I don't know that he rem remembered me or anything of that nature. He was just yeah. like, wow, okay. And, and uh, so he set up a tour and uh, I, I got to uh, do a bit of a tour and um, and I think I sat in with uh, Liz McKinney I think for a bit in the afternoon just like one afternoon mm -hmm. and um, and that was enough to make me interested in wanting to work because I didn't really know it was that it was really in reach um, and then um, yeah so I did uh, like you know a year at Pacific Radio Arts mm -hmm. volunteered a bunch at um, LG 73 ended up during the that year of taking school um, uh, working with uh, Howard Kogan who was Howie the Hitman on LG 73 I remember that name Howie the Hitman and the yeah. Evening Mob well I was part of the mob um, it started off just getting records and commercials for Howie complete nothing on air to being just some dumb zany characters <laughs> yeah and then from there off to Smithers and life <laughs> yeah so it really started as a passion it started mm -hmm. one as a passion and then two to i wanted to see the inside of the studio i wanted to see the inside of a radio station mm -hmm. and then uh that 
kind of led me into the fact that, okay, well, there is a path to having a job. Sorry. It's fine. That was me hitting the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Completely unpro, man. I'm sorry. The passion, the, the look inside the studio, and, um, and then uh, actual some education. Yeah. Yeah. It's my own version, really, of The Wizard of Oz. I guess so. Yeah. 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 Except, I, except I wore soccer boots as opposed to red slippers. <laughs> <laughs> now, like a lot of people in in the north know your voice. Not unlike they know my voice. I mean, we're we're constantly on the radio. Um, you work Monday through Friday. But what is not as well known is that your voice is heard and is familiar in other places as you do voice work mm-hmm. independently. Yeah. 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 And. I, Hawaii is one of the places. Am I correct? Yeah, there's a there's a station in Hawaii, um, Kumu K U M U. Yeah. And for like five years, I've been their station voice, which is which is totally bizarre, especially when you get like <laughs> when you, when I get copied to, to voice for like contests, and they're talking about you know beautiful things that are happening in Hawaii, and mm-hmm. it's it's you know the, the first of february in prince george <laughs> yeah it's playing yeah. freezing outside yeah <laughs> yeah so so that's neat yeah and uh, and every year i think um uh you know i'm just grateful that um that they've been really cool with uh with having me as their voice and um and uh, working with a couple of the guys out there and another guy in san diego so there's like the program director kelsey mm-hmm. k smooth in uh, in in Honolulu, and um, and uh, Pabs in San Diego. So that's so cool. Good audio. Well, it's, it's interesting. You got three, you know, two people, one voicing stuff and one producing stuff that aren't actually in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pablo is from Hawaii, so he um, he uh, you know he, he knows everything and is he usually gives me the pronunciations of uh, some of the, uh, the the locations, the terminology, the terminology. The, yeah, 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 yeah. So. A, a common question, and I know this is something that I have even asked, mm-hmm. is how does one get into a position to provide voice work? Like, it, it's a difficult question as is to be like, hey, how do I get on radio? Mm-hmm. But it's an even harder question to answer when it's like, hey, how can I have a studio and like have my voice be something, something, something? Because yeah. there's like people want to be in cartoons, people want to be in 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 video games and you know people want to be a voice yeah yeah um well i took a course with dan o'day and harlan hogan one time and they were very clear right off the top the business of the voiceover business is finding the business yes um it's easy to get started you know with gear and stuff like that easier than ever um and then it's just a matter of uh as one would in life um foster connections mm. um, you you know as we grow up we, we we meet people and friends and we p- treat people with some respect and and get it uh, get it back in return and the same in the, the business world no matter what the industry is and so the the key is when you start getting something um, to try to really keep those people um, because repeat business is, is fantastic. It's, it's business that you don't have to go and chase, right? Yeah. Um, but you're doing it. You've got a, you've got a great setup here, man. Like, well, thank I, you. I, I, now, now, this is not just because I'm sucking up to you or anything like that because we're recording. <laughs> I, walk, I walked in here and I was blown away. I'm like, man, this is awesome. And you've got like this great vibe going on in place of your dining room. You've got a studio, yes. you know, which is awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, like everything that you see is really, really cool. This is <laughs> this is all you know stuff back here that you see. You can walk next door and you'll see the exact same stuff over here as as you see in in his place. Right? Yeah, no, no. It's no. over here where it's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's just the living room. Um, <laughs> Well, you have my old chair over in the corner. I do. That is your old that chair. That is great, man. I saw that. I'm like, oh, all right. It's getting there's it's getting some use. I'll have to uh, I'll have to lounge back in that. I'm a little disappointed that you didn't have it set up right here for me. I well, if I could, I would have, but there yeah. would have been no opportunity for you to actually pull the lever and kick back. So. There you go. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Um, well, like like you, like I. I I've set myself up as best as possible. Like I'm fortunate enough to have people like yourself to help me out with like great things, including this microphone. And like I spent the extra money on the, on the board. And of course I've got this 
incredible rig that I, mm-hmm. like yeah. it's, it's more expensive than four of my last cars put together. Um, but like, like, yeah. And like, I've, I'm like you branching out. Like I'm, I'm not just doing this. I'm, I'm also like on social media. I'm also into video games. I do reviews and I, like I make connections, mm-hmm. you know, and it's very true of like, it's not what you know. Sometimes it's who, you know, mm. but to get to know someone, you have to reach out mm-hmm. and try to create that connection. It doesn't always work every once in a while. Like it, it'll just be like, no, we're just not interested in working with you. Nothing personal, just business. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's the most difficult thing. Rejection in any situation whatsoever. It's difficult to, to accept whether it's in life or business or uh, behind a microphone uh, because we take it kind of personally. You know, we take it personally as if, as if oh, you don't, you don't like me. <laughs> Like, you seriously don't like me, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, because it could be like, um, we, you know, we don't like that equation you came up with, you know, if you're an accountant or something, you know, find me more things I can write out. Yeah, write yeah, off, yeah, right? yeah. But, you know, somebody, when you when you lay down a vocal track and you send it off to somebody and a hundred other people are, are doing the exact same thing, inevitably there's going to be 99 people that go, they didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> And so, and so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's part of it is you understand that that's the deal. But eventually, you know, after you've done a bunch, you'll find somebody that does like you because yeah. you're different than everybody else. And that's the thing right now is, is, is a unique sound, um, and, uh, and, you know, personality, uh, you know, they're just looking for, um, in all honesty, um, non announcer announcers. You know they don't want people that have been radio, mm-hmm. which is which is which which is my struggle. And so yeah, you know now it's it's easier than ever to have access, but because it's easier, there's a lot of people in there. Mm-hmm. So you just keep chipping away. I mean, when I started, so so for me, um, if if we're if we're talking about me this evening, <laughs> um, <laughs> like like. I used to put away because I like to travel, right? And I wanted to go and see my grandmother over in England, and so I started putting away money every paycheck to a travel fund, and then it was like two hundred every every month or every paycheck to this travel fund, and I build up the travel fund, and then I'd spend it, and then I build it up, and then I'd spend it, but it would always come off my paycheck, right? And I've always wanted to do something from a voiceover perspective. I just didn't have the balls to do it to actually step forward and say I'm going to take this step. Eventually, um, you know, Buddy kind of pushed me over the edge and um, helped me along to get to that point. And I started only to uh, fund a travel account um, so that the travel money didn't come off my paycheck. Ah. That it was, you know, it was something else. And then that way it would just be nice and nice and 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 cool, right? Mm-hmm. Wouldn't have to worry too much about you know trying to grow this. If I had enough to travel, then all's all's fine. And um, you know it's grown a bit more than that for sure. Uh, but still, that's the spirit that I I embrace it. So it, you know I haven't gone full time or anything of that nature. Right. Um, so while I you know continue to have fun in radio, I you know have a an opportunity to um, to uh, still throw money into the travel account and then. Life happens, and other stuff has to be paid for as well. And it's always nice to have a few extra bucks. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. it's it's basically like because you and I working both working in media, both working in radio. Like it is our dream and it's our goal to just have a successful career using our skills, our talent. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting when you say like you know sometimes people just don't want. The radio voice they don't they want a more natural sound mm-hmm. um there was someone who I, I met who just started tuning in um actually listens online uh pointed out that you know each one of us that's you me jen and doug have a different sound mm-hmm. and she, she she pointed out the fact that you know doug very much has that morning radio zoo sound and jen is is kind of laid back but has that professional and then Darren, the afternoon guy, I mean, he sounds radio. He's got that rich voice and this cool delivery. And then you sound like a spastic who has way too much coffee but is enjoying themselves. And went, that's 
pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, if you met the three of us or the four of us, that's what you're going to get. Mm. You know, yeah. like we're all approachable, but we all have different energy. Well, and we all come from different parts in our lives as well. Uh, yeah. and, and so I think that, you know, if we're talking about uh, a, a cast over the course of, of the radio station, you know, yeah. that's, you know, the, the characters come from, from different places in, uh, in the human, t- human life, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, Jen's younger and then, than you, than me, than Doug. So, you know, I think that's good because we all come from different perspectives, but we, we all at the same time have a, have a love of the music, right? And that's a, that's the common thread that, that goes through us on the air, but yeah. also goes through our listeners as well. We're very much, uh, you know, cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Cut on the same album cuts <laughs> <laughs> as it would be, you know? Different sides of the Different album. Different sides of the <laughs> album, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? Um, if you could, mm-hmm. um, where would you like to take your career within the next blank years? You know, so I'm 53 now. Been whoa, in, whoa, whoa. Yeah. 53? Yeah. You look damn good for 53, sir. Well, thanks, Tiger. <laughs> thanks, Tiger. I appreciate that. <laughs> Tiger. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it would be neat for me to be able to just work from home by the time I'm 60. That would be neat. Yeah. And and that's kind of my goal, you know? So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, that's kind of the goal now. But uh, if it comes quicker, great. If it's a little bit later, whatever, you know? Mm. So that would be neat. I think that would be fun. I think that would be neat just to, to um, work out of, out of home for a while. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Um, it wasn't until the world went on shutdown mm-hmm. we realized that the technology was there mm-hmm. uh, and that we technology and gear wise were like more than capable of actually achieving that goal mm-hmm. yeah which is both entertaining and terrifying mm-hmm. yeah because you know, we, we all work with egos. Like We all have our own egos. Some of us keep our egos in check better than others. Um, but we have that persona and we have that pride amongst ourselves when we're on the radio. And it is a little bit scary to know that, oh, yeah, I could do this from home. And then for it to <laughs> click and go, wait, so could anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. And, th- and that's the case. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people on the radio that are not in a station. You know, and they've set um, even before, yeah. um, before COVID and everything, right? Um, KLOS. Uh, I can't remember the Kevin and Bean. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, and I, I, I can't remember which one um, was based out of Washington State, and one was based out of Los Angeles, and then, and then so he he he, he lived in um, outside of Seattle somewhere, maybe on an island outside mm-hmm. of Seattle. And if, if and if I have this wrong, I apologize. Yeah. Right? Don't take anything you you hear on the internet as just, gospel. Just fact check us in yeah. the comments below. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. And anyway, so he would fly into into um, uh, into Los Angeles for you know big events and things of that nature, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been it's been possible for for some time. I think what the lockdown did is it showed that it's not only possible, but it's it's pretty easy. Yeah, with where the technology is today, yeah. and um, and doesn't cost a lot, um, you know. So it, it, I did a couple of shows at, from from home as well, you know, over the, uh, the the pandemic. Yes, which was cool. Yeah, um, and, and so it'd be neat to be able to do like half and half because you know it'd be, it'd be strange. Like after like when I'm sixty, maybe you know. And I'm, and I'm verging on being, you know, cr- crotchety old guy, you know, right? You know, I can, I can, you know, maybe people might bug me more or something like that uh, when, when I'm older. <laughs> and and I'm ha- perfectly happy from doing some work at home. Yeah. But in, in the meantime, between now and then, it would actually be kind of neat to do kind of half and half, because you know, there's the comfort, and sometimes you kind of get in a groove, and and when you're at home and and doing stuff. Um, but then there's a social side as well. You know, the, there there really is a. a, a a fun harmony with uh, a group of people in the hall mm-hmm. all jonesing on the same thing that they enjoy in our case it's radio and sound and and stuff like that so yeah it, it, you know there's i think there's got to be a balance or in my sorry in my world um you know having a nice balance between the two is, is yeah. ideal 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's kind of one of the weird things about what we do is that we we entertain. We entertain the public. I hope so. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. <laughs> well, we entertain the but you public. Know, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. We entertain the public. Um, and even though we're, we're locked off into a studio... Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't doesn't matter where the world is health wise pandemic wise we were still in a studio mm-hmm. um, but at the same time like we are still reaching out from a studio and we have a captive audience be it uh, them in a car or at work or something jail jail <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. but we we want that feedback right and yeah. so you know working from home great and all but you know yes I agree like the 50 50 stuff would be able to just have that privacy and have that comfort of being able to work from home and just being able to relax but at the same time like it's nice to have that interaction Mm -hmm. and to be with people who are either enjoying your work or are in the same thread of that work yeah Yeah. sure oh yeah absolutely it's good to be around people yes it is Uh, you know as long as everybody's safe and respectful yes it is Yeah. yeah but you wanted to bring up something else about entertainment Oh yeah, sorry. Sometimes little ideas just go shooting through my brain, and yeah. then they they lose, they they get lost. Um, so here's something. So we're like, like when you said we 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 entertain people, we're yeah. there to entertain people. Yes. And uh, and I don't I don't know. I've I've gone through this shift, or maybe not. I think I've always sort of been this way. Um, there's entertaining people, and then there's hanging out with people. Hmm. And uh, and and so my my approach has always been to to be um, like I was at a gathering and just one of the people there hanging out mm-hmm. um, as opposed to entertaining, you know, like putting on a show and bits and things of that nature. So I don't know. It's an interesting interesting discussion. I don't know if you've kind of gone through that in your brain because god knows we you know when <laughs> when we listen back to ourselves sometimes or whatever it's like oh where the hell is my head but <laughs> but just that the perspective between entertaining and hanging out mm. well case in point i was a part of a golf event yesterday okay and it was it was fun to just be a part of a team and we we did mediocre it was fine, but it was great to be there and just hang out. And yes, I'm representing our station. And yes, there are clients who have advertised with our station. But it was fun to be at an event and not have the pressure of being the spotlight, the guy, mm. the guy in front of the microphone. But at the same time, like there to entertain just like anyone else. Mm. Um at times, I would take that over being in the spotlight, having a microphone, and presenting something. But it's the you're like the host entertainer. Th- I am. You're not. Yeah, the, you're not yeah. the. Sh- you're not the show guy entertainer. You're the host that greets people at the door and says, "Hey, come on in. Thanks. I am. You know. L- l- you know. Welcome. And uh, let me know if you need anything and that kind of stuff." When I was the uh, instant host for the Prince George Cougars. Mm-hmm. Um, packed house or you know a, a slow night or whatever as soon as i got that microphone and i went out to the center ice mm. i was at home oh that's great right yeah. it's amazing what it, what it can do right? oh yeah yeah right and think of think of is it linus from the snoopy from uh from the peanuts that carries the um the uh the blanket around all the time that was pig pen pig pen yes. thank you so much yeah <laughs> sorry that's sorry fine. sorry pig pen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, but but the microphone becomes like a security blanket. Yes, a, com- a comfort a comfort blanket sometimes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It like I I would go out there and I, I knew I had a script. I had I had something to do, be it run a contest or give a promotion or or something. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had to do that, but I was at home comfortable, and I wasn't always polished. Like I like I, I messed up every once in a while. Like we do that. We're not machines. We are there to entertain, and sometimes something will come into our head and just kind of sidetrack us, and off we go. <laughs> but at the same time, you have that same traffic problem. Oh that yeah. I, that I have. yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's inherent. <clears throat> um, it comes with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, like I've always been like the host, entertainer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so 
the, the, one of the highlights of my life was a packed house inside CN Center. It was during the Subway Super Series. Mm-hmm. Not a single empty seat in the house. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just chomping at the bit to grab that microphone and go out into the center ice and do my thing, right? Yeah. And it was it was a rush to have the reaction from the entire audience. And that's just that's just something I've always wanted to do. Yeah, well, that's I mean, when you get that, that's why people entertain. Yes. You know, whether it's stand-up comedy or or if it's a band or something like that, um, you know, that's that's why people you know do that for that for that rush and and people you know responding to something that you say, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's great. Like I remember um, uh, walking out at Salmon Valley, and um, Tom Cochran played out at Salmon Valley. It was Canada Day, mm-hmm. good guy to have for Canada Day, and there was an opening act and um, called Famous Blue Raincoat, and I, I can't remember if they've ever ever did anything after that, mm-hmm. but I certainly had never heard of them before that either, right? <laughs> and uh, and so I walk out, and as I'm walking out, I realize I've forgotten the name of the band. There's 6,000 people out there, right? And I'm to introduce this band. And so I just, I get out there and, and the mic is a happy place for me. Yes. So I start talking and I start talking about uh, different things that are happening. And um, uh, and then all of a sudden, the name Famous Blue Raincoat jumps into my brain. And I'm like, ladies and gentlemen, Famous Blue Raincoat. And <sighs> actually, it wasn't like that at all. It was like a couple of dudes that were clapping. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody else wasn't really paying attention because Tom Cochran wasn't going to be on for like another hour and a half and there's this band that we've never heard of but anyway once you get into that comfort you know like the little comfort zone of around yeah. the microphone sometimes things happen yeah. I, I've had that too before where it's like you know, you're you're getting ready you have your notes you're, you're re- running in through your mind and then and then you, you go to turn on a mic- microphone and it's just before you hit that button it's a sudden panic and your mind goes bloop and it's gone, uh, right? Like, uh, 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 and then you turn on the microphone because you got no time left, and then you start rolling, and then it all starts flooding back. Like, oh, okay, get back on the track, and <laughs> off we go. Well, it's interesting you, you use the word um, panic and maybe poof. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, but like a number of years ago, um, I don't know if I told you the story before. I've told you off air, I'm sure. But um, So I went through about six months of heavy-duty panic attacks, like all the time, right? Um, anxiety and, you know, mild panic attacks would sort of pop in every now and again. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like a little knock on the door. And... Um, and I didn't really deal with it at all. And then, then one day, all of a sudden, boom, it hit, and it was crazy. Like, um, like you know, a serious, you know, mental health crisis. Right. right. And my brother um, had, you know, long history of mental health issues, and um, and without a lot of success. And so this kind of freaked me out and was very scary. Um, and as I worked through that, what was interesting is that the only place where the world couldn't get to me was when I was on the microphone. Like I'd be in the station, uh, ready to run out of the station and and just go out and be outside, um, but couldn't. Mm. And uh, put on my headphones, turn on the microphone, and with the adrenaline just rushing at fever pitch, yeah. turn on the microphone, and whoom, that uh, that anxiety kind of adrenaline gone as I'm talking uh, through the microphone. Mm. Turn the microphone off. Whoom! Back it comes. Right. Yeah, yeah. So during that period on air, I was talking more than I ever yeah. did in my life. Right. <laughs> I don't want to leave. The, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. The boss is like, "Why are your breaks like three minutes long?" <laughs> because it's my happy place. Yeah. So you know, and and you know what? It, it's um, you know, everybody has their little comfort zones, right? But yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, I agree. Like this is. This is my comfort zone. Yeah. Right? Being at the station or even just having a conversation like Mike's be damned mm-hmm. like having a conversation it because again it goes back to my l- discovery love of talk radio, listening to stories mm-hmm. and telling stories. Like we we all walk different paths and we all experience different things. It's life is like art. You and I can look at something a, a piece of art that's in front of us hanging on a wall or whatever and we will take different things from it and we will translate different feelings from that same piece of art yeah 
right. as we try to paint the canvas in someone's mind with our words. That kind of art? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> or, or, or are you talking Garfunkel? Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, the less handsome of the two. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, you know, that's, um, you know, uh, um, I guess, that, you know, there's the art of the conversation um, mm-hmm. uh, that we try to, try to, I don't know, achieve every now and again. Yeah. Um, often it just kind of, you know, peters off, but that's, that's in any conversation. You know, you're at a gathering or something, you're having a conversation with somebody, and, and all of a sudden it's kind of like, eh, Peter's off, and then there's a bit of awkward silence as nobody, you know, wants to say anything next, and then you just kind of come up with something, boom, you go off on a, another little tangent, yeah. like I'm going off on right now. <laughs> that's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, um, we're going to wrap the. Wrap oh, things no, up. we yes. don't need to wrap it up, do yes, we? Yes, we do. Yes, we well, do. Is there a time limit on this thing? Uh, well, she's sitting right over there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I see. I see. <laughs> Gotcha. No, I didn't okay. want to. I didn't want to keep you for too long, anyway. So. Oh no, no worries. Um, so, where can people find you on social media and tell them about your website? Um, okay. Well, this is bad. I'm not really on social media all that much because okay. I'm um, I'm really kind of lazy, to be honest with you. You know, I'm 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 lazy. I'm I'm lazy on a lot of things. I'm not lazy on on some things, but mm. things that I need to do for myself, I'm lazy on at times. Um, it's a long way of saying uh, I'm Darren dot Coogan on Instagram, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife and I, we share, we actually share a page on Facebook, which is actually kind of smart. Well, you know, we we just didn't know what we were doing way back when, right? As <laughs> so we were stuck with it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but um, Darren Coogan dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got some stuff on there with, um, you know, d- different things that I've voiced and 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 whatnot. Uh, no radio stuff. Mm-hmm. Because um, uh, just turn on the station. <laughs> yeah. and is, that, is that okay for that's, that's totally a shameless fine. plug? Yeah, yeah, yeah why yeah. not? We yeah. both work there. There you go. <laughs> well, thanks for having me over, man. This is the first time I've been able to uh, see your place. Uh, and, and, um, and, like, I'm honest. Like, in, my reaction was just so... You yeah, I was, uh, you know, it, because I've, I, I, I've, I known you for some time. Yes. And, um, and I know, I've known of some of your struggles over the course of, of time. Yes. And, and, and what I know above all of that is that you're just a good guy. Oh, thank you. Right. <laughs> and, um, and so it was, it was neat when I saw your space and it gave up off just a, a really good vibe. It was like, I was, I was genuinely happy for you. Oh, thank and, you. And, you know, had it not been, um, a global pandemic would have given you a big hug. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. That's what. Hence, I mean. the microphones are so far away. <laughs> yeah, that's what I miss the most. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure, and yeah, again, let, let let us blame the the world and the position it was in for uh, you finally come over to my place after knowing each other for who knows how long. But yeah. I've been to your place. Yeah quite a few times but yeah. you're I mean I'd love to have you over and we can turn off the microphones and we just shoot the shit for a while or we can just shoot the shit and just have the microphones running and see what the hell you come <laughs> up with right um, but, uh, but okay so but the next time I come back yes. promise me this uh, we don't talk about radio fine done I okay. can that's that's so easily done <laughs> <laughs> All thanks right. Darren thank you I mean for lack of a, an inventive term um, I am a fitness coach. Uh, I try and incorporate the word wellness in there somewhere because I think as a society, we've forgotten that fitness stems from wellness. um, And wellness is so much deeper than aesthetics, which sometimes fitness can be a little bit muddled. Um, We tend to forget that fitness is a small part of a much bigger picture, um, especially when it comes to aesthetics and overall wellness. So I'd consider myself a health and wellness coach first. Um, And that way as well, I mean, it it plays into the people I work with, um, a large part of who aren't just chasing aesthetics, but that overall health and wellness type of ideal. Um, But I'm also the owner of my own company, Strong Her Fitness. Name might be changing soon because I think it gets uh, confusing for gentlemen. They think I potentially don't work with dudes, but rest assured, I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but for now, stronger fitness. Um, and yeah, I'd consider myself a basically a health and wellness professional, kind of navigating the waters that is the 21st century world of health and fitness. Where did this journey begin, and what inspired you to start this? 
company of yours, this business of yours? Um, I mean, I was always active. Uh, I grew up in a family that uh, kind of walked the line between physical activity and uh, having a bad relationship with food. So as a result, I was one of those kids who was naturally strong and I could like run and play sports, but was very overweight at the same time. Uh, So I think it was about when I was... 15, a girlfriend and I um, were both basically in the same position. We just one summer, just, I don't know why, I don't know whose idea it was, but we found ourselves at the high school track and we were like, let's just race. They think we ran like 15 seconds and we were like, I'm done. I'm going to throw up. (laughs) And, uh, and then we just found ourselves there every day, just like chasing that hunger to go a little bit further or a little bit faster. Um, And then it just carried on from there. It like, if you've ever run, you recognize the fact that you go through that phase of like, I hate this. It's absolutely terrible. And then one day you kind of just wake up and you're like, I'm addicted to it now. And uh, so I just ran every day for the better part of a year and a half, maybe two years. I even got a gym membership in the winter because as well, actually you're in BC. So you have some <laughs> nice winters, but uh, winters here, especially when I was growing up, so much snow, so cold. I was not running outside. Uh, so got a gym membership, didn't touch weights. I just went to use the treadmill, just kept on running. Um, and then one day a trainer at LA, it was LA Fitness, uh, came up to me. And just said, like, you know, you're here every day, like you've lost a lot of weight at this point. Um, Do you want to be a trainer? And I had never thought about it. And at that point, I was like, hell no, (laughs) I'm just here to, you know, keep running. Um, But it was that seed that kind of planted it for me. After high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Actually, I thought about going to radio broadcasting. Funny enough. Really? Uh, yeah, I really did. I was like DJing for fun at the time because I just always loved music. And mm-hmm. um, I really th- I really thought about it. I actually applied and got into some schools, but it just I didn't wind up going. So it took a couple years off. I met this great dude um, who really helped me get into the fitness space. And really, I was lifting weights at that point, but not really knowing what I was doing. Um, and he really encouraged me just like with my personality, with my physique at that point to pursue it. And I did, and I loved it. Uh, but you know, the reason, the big switch for me into making it into a career of mine was because when I first started running, uh, I lost about 50 pounds in my journey of running. Now exercise is obviously a huge component of that, but I had changed my diet as well, but I had no idea what I was doing on a nutritional basis. Even the research that I was doing, I was getting this, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the same things we see now, like 15 years later, which is, you know, cut all your carbs or don't eat much fat, stop eating after 6 p.m. And so I kind of did all of that. I ate very little carbs. I ate, I remember telling myself, don't eat more than 30 grams of fat a day. I have no idea why, but it was something that I did. Needless to say, uh, within a few years of losing the weight, I think it was about three years, I gained it all back every single pound because it just wasn't sustainable. And it really sucks because it takes a lot of work to get to that point, only to turn around and feel like you're back at square one and you spend years doing it. Um, so I realized I wanted to come up with a space where people could just find information that was as straightforward as possible, but also as honest as possible, even if it's not necessarily the thing that you want to hear. Um, and that's kind of just like where my desire came from. And then of course, just like continuing to educate myself and fall more in love with, uh, weightlifting and fitness and what that looks like for different people. And, you know, there, there's honestly no greater feeling than helping somebody else accomplish a goal that they have, especially when it is so related to something like health, which is a part of our everyday life, whether it's getting off of meds or, you know, just not being out of breath when you go for a walk anymore. It's a really big gift. Uh, So that's kind of like where it started, what it turned into, where it came from. I I, I giggle when you when you say like, you know, going for a walk and and being out of breath because uh, it was like Facebook and social media has this wonderful thing where it's like, hey, remember this from such and such time ago? And it reminded me that uh, my health journey truly started just over a decade ago. And I remember my breaking point of going up a flight of stairs in my own townhouse and being winded at the very top of those stairs and then realizing at that point that like, I need help. Like I, I need yeah. to get my life in order. 
So it, 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 can, it can be a sobering thought once uh, your body goes, uh, we need to fix this at some point in time, you know? Totally, totally, yeah. totally. When uh, you say an unhealthy relationship with food, uh, mm-hmm. that, that, that kind of spans a lot of things. Like immediately what comes to mind is, is sitting down on the couch with a bag of nacho chips and just not doing anything other than consuming the entire bag. And then afterward wondering if there's anything else you can eat, but an unhealthy relationship with food isn't necessarily just that it can be a mindset or a point of view or even like a self fulfilling punishment of I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to because I crave it. So what what was it for you when you said unhealthy relationship with food? For me, like growing up in my family, um, where that stemmed from. Uh, so my we were all, except for my sister, um, and I say that with no resentment. I love that. I love her. I always have loved her. But everyone in my family um, was basically overweight. And my mom was probably the first person to lose weight. Um, however the like the the relationship with food i learned growing up was basically that there was no moderation there was um you binged or you didn't (laughs) and uh you know that was a big thing um especially because you know when we when we know that calorie deficits are so important or just like calorie intake is so important deficit obviously if you're just losing weight but calorie intake being so important even when you're overeating things like you know homemade soup with rice it's making a difference and um it's making a difference especially as a teenager because you're shutting off those hunger cues that your body would normally give you Mm. so growing up i don't ever remember having a normal hunger cue of being like i'm too full like i remember going to restaurants with my cousin and being like i am going to beat you in terms of how many pizza slices i can eat um we've all we've all been there (laughs) yeah oh yeah like it was all or nothing we were like go big or go home yeah um and then likewise you paired that up and I bring up something like soup specifically because a lot of people will think, well, that's something healthy, but you can over consume anything. So, you know, Monday to Thursday, my family had the mentality of eating healthy foods, even though we were still over consuming them. Mm. Um, And then the weekend was an indulgence period. So now you take that binging and you apply it to pizza and ice cream, um, you know, and all those things. And that's really where, yeah, my unhealthy relationship with food um, stemmed from, where it came from, Mm. um, what it pretty much centered around, just overconsumption, not ever recognizing like when my body said, I've had enough. And likewise, um, I don't really ever remember also then feeling hunger because I was just always overconsumed. You have the title. It, 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 I don't know if there's an accent because I've never actually, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard you say your name, but is it Coach Frizzle or Coach Frizzell? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I should totally do it with the accent. Just to be a little bit extra. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, gen- uh, I genuinely up until this point was just going by Coach Frizzle, okay. um, kind of like uh, Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus, um, because yeah, I, I, I think we're from the same generation. So yes. I mean, that was such a, <laughs> yeah, great show back in the day. And it was so cool. Uh, and it, it was so true. She made science fun. Like mm-hmm. I paid more attention to her than I did in, in, in those TV shows than I did in school. And I think uh, I really related to that uh now having my own business and taking something like fitness which a lot of people don't enjoy and don't find fun um and trying to make it fun for people again trying to make it educational but like still fun um yeah so definitely coach frizzle but maybe uh maybe i'll start using the accent (laughs) (laughs) what was it like the first time you you started to consider yourself being a coach because you were approached by someone else from outside when you were just working on yourself and they were the one who planted that seed into your head saying like hey you're doing great you could help others if you wanted to so what was it like the first time you consider yourself like mentally like i'm a coach this is happening i think some days i still don't realize that like i'm a coach i'm like wow i actually do this um i think that like 
the first time, to, to be honest, the first time I realized that I was a coach, I, you know, I say that laughingly now about not realizing if this is a legit thing, but I think that was something I thought actually for a very long time. And so when I look back, I, I probably wasn't a great coach because I didn't have much confidence in knowing what I was doing at the time. But once I realized the power, again, that I did have to like impact people's lives, I, I think I said this at the beginning, there's like truly no greater gift um, because, you know, it's one thing to accomplish your own goals and know how good that feels. Mm. I almost feel like it's like, it's like a parent. I personally don't have kids, but just, um, you know, watching my friends with their kids, siblings with their kids and stuff. When you give your, your child a gift or let's say like Santa Claus, like, you know, hopefully everyone out there watching knows that Santa Claus, you know, uh, is not real. (laughs) You're like, I know that this isn't real, but I know the joy it gave me as a child. And I want to pass that on to my kids. It's kind of like that once I realized that I had the power to give somebody else such a big gift, I think it's, uh, it was like shocking to me. It was humbling. Um, it was at times like, um, you know what? No, not at times, almost all the time. I feel like I'm not doing enough to be honest, because I just Mm -hmm. want to continue to learn more, figure more out, do more, uh, for, my clients, potential clients, the people that just follow me on social media. And um, yeah, I keep saying it's a gift, but honestly, I, I think every day I, I do genuinely feel like that because to have somebody's trust in the aspect of their health and their fitness is a gift. It really is. It's a huge vulnerable part of somebody's life. And so that's why I probably feel like I'm not doing enough even to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like that because it makes me hungry for more. You ever had someone uh, come into your life uh, professionally and you you could see the ambition, you can see the drive, but at the same time, you can see maybe some massive uh, misconceptions, massive mistakes or whatever that they had either took on themselves or just gotten some bad advice. Even in clients that like... I speak to on a daily basis. Whenever someone, you know, contacts me, we always do a phone call together so I can get a sense for where they're at. Um, And that's why I find it, we're at a really interesting point in the health and fitness industry where we learn so much from like the nineties and, you know, the early two thousands and we laugh at the stuff now, but yet it's still kind of going on and it's still kind of being passed on maybe even with different names. So you get these people that, you know, like you said, have so much drive, have so much passion, have so much determination, but are stuck in the mindset of what we learned as teenagers, um, you know, or what we picked up from our parents because, I can't tell you the amount, especially to be honest, of women who I speak to now who first recognized dieting behavior when they were like eight or 10 because they saw their mom doing it or or their aunt doing it. And that was projected onto them, even as young kids. Um, You know, a big one is the no eating after 6 p.m., I find. Mm -hmm. Um, And also still the like no carb thing, especially bagels. I don't know what people have an issue with with bagels, um, but so many women, especially when it comes to like moms and aunts projecting, still, uh, you know, one of my clients messaged me the other day and said her aunt was over and this client is 40 years old with kids of her own. And her aunt was like, are you really eating that whole bagel? And, uh, you know, when it comes to misconceptions, there's so many out there and, uh, and it's really unfortunate because it's probably the biggest thing holding most people back. Cause like you said, so many people have the drive and determination, Mm -hmm. but if those misconceptions really actually do play out in their life, then it it's probably the biggest roadblock I see. Yeah. We we tend to learn from our own mistakes best. It, it's difficult sometimes to hear advice come from someone else when we have something in our mind. We we, we want to try, we want to do, we believe something's working. But when, when those mistakes come and we learn from those mistakes, we go, okay, so the advice I heard earlier, that was true, but I'm glad I know now firsthand, never going to do that again. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Your uh, social media, uh, you, you're you not afraid to go out and uh, and, and do some uh, shopping, 
to say the least. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, a friend of mine who is someone who just informed me that uh, they've been talking to you through Instagram about cereal and a specific type of protein cereal called Magic Spoon and asked you whether or not you've tried it yet. Yes. No, I haven't. I have not tried Magic Spoon yet. I keep saying that I'm going to order some. I haven't. I guess I just somewhere in my mind, I'm like, maybe if I just keep mentioning it, they'll hear about it and just send me a box. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. I mean, let's get it out there. Let's see if we can both get some cereal. Yeah. Um, Magic Spoon, hook us up. Um, Generally what I... Yeah. Generally, what I do is like I, I I put out some questions towards uh my I, I put out the suggestion for questions to my Patreon followers, uh, to my guests if they want. But uh, my one friend here is just like, oh my god, you're talking to Coach Frizzle right now, and and she was saying that uh, you guys actually had a conversation on Instagram about the Magic Spoon. Uh, she's such a cereal freak. She hadn't tried it and ended up ordering some, and I wanted to let her know how it was, and uh, so. If you don't mind, I'm going to just yeah, tell yeah. you. Um, she said she actually ordered six different types of cereal. There was strawberry, banana, blueberry, <laughs> frosted cookies, and cream, as well as fruity, which is basically Fruit Loops. Each serving is roughly 12 grams of protein. At this point in time, Magic Spoon better sponsor both of us. Uh, yeah, they actually taste really freaking good. And the one is so similar to Fruit Loops, it's kind of scary. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Wow, the toucan better be worried, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, no, I really do need to order some, especially like as soon as you said that, like frosted. Mm, yeah. Cream. I'm like, man, especially with the winter time, you see all the like frosted, you know, sugar cookies and stuff. Oh. Ooh, oh, I, I do. I need to. I need to have some. I had cereal this morning as a pre workout. Yeah. Um, I need, this is the fact that you're bringing it up now. I have to order some. <laughs> I think I think it's gonna you know I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask her if there's any sort of promo promo code. We might just have yeah. to go down the chain at this point in time. Um, yeah, for sure. When when it, when it comes to cereal and me, uh, I I made one of those mistakes uh, many many years ago. I, I took on a nutrition coach uh, uh, about eight nine years ago, and her and I just didn't jive. Like there's a coach for everyone, and not everyone is a good coach for everyone. And she was very restricted and re- aggressive when it came to my diet and I just mentally I wasn't prepared for that much of a drastic change I was still learning and still losing weight but at the same time I was still mentally and physically struggling to find my new place in life and I I, I remember a back and forth where she asked me like what do I have for breakfast and I said, well, I had multigrain Cheerios. And she goes, you're not a effing kid anymore. Have blah, 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 blah. And it was just like this entire grocery list. And I looked at that. So it was such a daunting change that yeah. I mentally I just was not prepared for. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. First of all, I am a kid still. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, all I can do is like shake my head at that. It's she like sh- I'm going to assume that she was maybe more of um, a bro style eater, for lack of a better term. Um, and it's you know, it's one of those things that if you don't allow people to have the things that they enjoy, they're never gonna get anywhere sustainable you know that those are the people that we hear say things like oh when my diet is done when this is over and you know when you hear that you're missing a very key thing there there is no over this is like if you're usually we hear people say this when they're trying to lose weight or lose fat um the way that you're eating should never really change it should honestly just come down to the portion sizes maybe you're eating more protein um you know maybe at times you have to lower your carbs a bit not cut them but just lower them but like nothing should really change but i totally feel you i remember one of the first coaches i had literally and it was a meal plan which i mean they should have never been giving out anyways but um one of the snacks was celery and mustard what? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> no it it was you know and at the time like I did I think I lasted on that plan for like a month 
And I was just like, I'm, I'm going to kill someone. And I remember at one point saying, like, this snack is disgusting. And I do like mustard. And I do like celery. But not as a snack together. She was like, okay, well, you could switch it up and have broccoli. I was like, that's worse. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Great. I'm going uh, from the taste of watered down green to ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, literally. It's, uh, it's brutal. It's yeah. absolutely brutal. How important is it to find that middle ground between yourself and someone coming to you for help when it comes to not only diet, but also a workout plan? As an example, when I, I, I talked to that first nutritionist, uh, it was such a drastic change from what I was doing. Now, granted, I was figuring things out as I go, but at the same time, I mean, it, I was going from things that I could learn to cook and recipes I was finding and things that I was working with and things I was enjoying to all this stuff that I had no idea where to start and didn't even know what it tasted like. And a few things that I just flat out did not enjoy whatsoever. There was no yeah. balance. There was no compromise between myself and the coach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, totally. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> Hugely important. Yeah. Um, so whenever I take a new client on, one of the first things I tell them is, it, um, or sorry, when we do a call together, one of the first things I tell them in terms of how my coaching works is that for the first two to three weeks, we're not even going to touch your nutrition. Um, because a big aspect is uh, like you said, like when you were doing it on your own, you're figuring things out along the way. Even when you start with a coach, there's a big chunk of times where you're figuring things out. First of all, the coach is figuring you out and how your body responds. You're figuring the coach out. You're figuring out the new protocols out. Um, you know, just taking on what the coach designs for you in terms of a workout program, or at least for me, mm -hmm. is a huge adaptation on its own. And sometimes we make the mistake as coaches or even as, you know, the, the trainees uh, where we think just give it all to me at once. But that's like, you're asking to burn out. You're asking to be overwhelmed. You're asking to quit early. Yeah. So, um, I, I always say to people, I have the education, I have the, you know, the macro, the, sorry, the calculators, the formulas, I can figure all your nutrition out for you. But at the end of the day, it's going to mean nothing if I don't know how you currently eat now. Yeah. Uh, and a big, Part of why we do that is because again, it'll give them that way the time to adjust just to the workout program and we can see how their like body adapts. Um, but also uh, in that time, I get them to track what they're currently eating, not just on a macro basis, but on a food journal basis, because I want to know what they like to eat and when, and you know, if we see trends, um, you know, on when you tend to have crashes or sweet tooths. Um, and again, we do this for more than a week because depending who I'm working with, let's take a female hormones are going to largely affect the week that you're having, the food that you're eating and all of that stuff. And then when, you know, that kind of tracking phase is over, we look at, I always say I don't design meal plans, but I do design uh, programs like with the person. We'll design a meal plan together and it will be based around the food that you have been eating over the last three weeks. We're just going to make it fit your macros because again, that's all it really comes down to figuring out, you know, your calorie intake. Now, do I have people that like literally only eat processed foods and no vegetables? Absolutely. Um, so yes, there is a balance between understanding you need to have vitamins and minerals. Like we need to make sure our body is fueled so that we can live long and healthy lives. But that's the thing. I think people forget it's the way you, it's the way that you look honestly at the food are you looking at it as in this is only for fuel and kind of like i have to do this and i have to eat this then or are you understanding the fact that like i'm having you know a donut now and i'm having a salad and chicken or rice and asparagus and chicken later it, it's a it, i know i ran went on a tangent there but it's such a huge thing like there really is no success or sustainability without balance without continuing to eat what you want now well just finding those tweaks that will usually make all the difference. Forgive me. Uh, I, I tend to go into these uh, interviews with enough information just to start a conversation. So I might be asking a silly question here, but uh, have you ever competed? Um, I have not. No. Um, thought about it. I think about it all the time. Um, certain phases of my life, current, like this phase currently, I literally think about it every day right now. 
Um, but ultimately, no, not as of right now. I always say to people, I basically want to look like my physique is like I, my my goals are to just always get stronger because there's nothing more fun than that. But like uh, how I like my bo- body tone, my muscle mass is like I always want to look as if I'm like eight weeks out. Um, plus, it's just like fun that way. Let's be honest. It always feels good when people say, do you compete? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice. You work hard. But no, I have not competed yet. Mm. Maybe in the future. It is something I do really think about, um, but not as of yet. Have you coached anyone who does compete? Um, no, also no. not as of yet. Um, you know, I think I think that's a whole other ball game, especially when it comes to like hormones. And um, again, I have a great base of knowledge. I just think it's a um, it's a different ball game, and I probably wouldn't take anyone on unless. I do compete at least once myself to really get a firsthand experience because relatability is huge. You know, I, I don't want to say I know what it feels like to be three weeks out, um, a week out, peak week and not. Yeah. So the two would probably go hand in hand uh, if and when we'll keep you posted. <laughs> I'm like, what? I just know how much you do have to wind up giving up in those last few weeks. I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know. Well, from from my experience and, and witnessing other people go through that process, I mean, like it's it's like any other competition. Doesn't matter if it's bodybuilding. Doesn't matter if it's a big game, uh, a sporting event, uh, drag racing, even uh, something uh, mental, psychological, something literature or anything like that. You have to prepare for something, and with preparedness and a giant challenge in front of you, there is sacrifice that has to be made. Yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. So if someone were to approach you with, you know, looking for help, uh, e- either to just feel better, look better, lose weight, reach a certain physical goal, how would they do it? And what could they expect at the very start? If somebody, sorry, if somebody wanted to reach out, yes. um, they could either do so honestly on any of my social media channels, um, which is literally coach frizzle on Instagram and TikTok. Um, or I do have a website, but that would be under strongherfitness.org. Um, basically what's going to happen is they're going to fill out a coaching application. So it's a pretty in-depth form. I ask someone to fill up right off the get-go. Uh, mm-hmm. cause again, just the more I know about somebody, the better, and I want to know it all. <laughs> um, so they'll fill out a form like that. And then I usually reach out, uh, via email within 48 hours. Um, we hop on like a phone call or a video chat like this and kind of just like, honestly, uh, I, was, I don't know if I can swear, shoot the shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, um, totally fine. <laughs> We've already gone over um, the Santa issue, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At this point, your listeners are scarred. They're like, what is <laughs> Um, Yeah, so we'll honestly, I just, I want to keep things, again, like I said, coaching is very vulnerable. It's a huge part of somebody's life. Um, And so, and like you even kind of mentioned earlier, you're not going to vibe with everyone. And I think it's really important to vibe with who you work with on such a vulnerable topic. So I want to have a phone call or video chat as much as I want them to, to see if we kind of connect. Um, And from there, we'll, we'll go over like all the stuff in the questionnaire, we'll ramble. And I will at that point kind of already have a game plan based off the form that somebody has filled out and what I hear them talk about with me on the phone. Mm. From there... Um, if we decide to get started together, what usually happens is the first three weeks, we put them on a workout program only. Um, we kind of look at what they're currently eating. We don't change anything nutritionally. And then week three and onwards, uh, cause at that point, hopefully as well, we're kind of in a routine with either daily steps or workouts or whatever it might be. We look at either adding nutritional changes might be really small changes at first, mm-hmm. or we might make a complete change and just you know, dive right in, um, and start with whatever it might be. But most of the time I will have, um, clients track at some point. And I say at some point and in some way, because a lot of people hear the word tracking and automatically think, you know, it's calorie counting, it's macro tracking, but it's not necessarily true. You know, that's not for everybody. And if it's not for somebody, I would tend to put them on either a hand tracking method or a plate tracking method. It's a lot easier to do. Um, it's a lot more efficient for people who don't like to track every little bit. And it usually still gets the job done. 
The reason why I'm so insistent on tracking at some point, whether it's with calories or hands or plates, um, is because it is truly the thing that draws the most awareness to what portion sizes should look like. Um, you know, a lot of people tend to, uh, myself included at one point, it's really easy to eat carbs and fats. It's super easy. Uh, we tend to struggle the most. A lot of people think, this is enough protein and it's nowhere near enough. So some type of tracking is honestly just great for awareness. Um, and plus I find in that sense, you will never feel unprepared wherever you are in your life. If you know roughly what your portion sizes should look like or what a meal kind of breakdown should look like, it doesn't matter if you're at a restaurant, at a school reunion, at a friend's house, at a beach in Puerto Vallarta, which is where I was right now, uh, you know, at the buffet line, you will know how to eat according to what your body needs and still have that balance. Um, I got a few questions from Patreon. This was from Dawn and she asks, what is your favorite treat food Ooh, ice cream 100%. ice cream yeah. yeah um i mean if uh, i guess that'd be more of a dessert but man i'm a huge ice cream fan i love ice cream that was probably how i gained most of my weight as a kid because i used to when i was old enough to come home and be by myself i would come home and make a huge ice cream sundae every day oh. for like yeah for a long time so like if you're ever over at my house, I will make you the best ice cream sundae you've ever had. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I love ice cream. If you're looking for more of a like food food, um, that's so hard. I love food. It, it's so dependent. Like right now, currently, I really would love to go for Indian food. I love butter chicken and rice and bread. Um, homemade food, mm -hmm. uh, probably pasta. And to oh. be honest, I don't... I don't. Yeah, your pasta. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. And you can do so much with it. Yeah. I actually don't eat it that often because it is one of those things that I still like. It's hard for me to have a portionable size of, of pasta. I'll li like, I would just eat noodles and butter and cheese and be like, oh, I ate this entire bag. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's so this good. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly, 100%. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But proportions are an issue because like, it's like, oh, I'll just have a little bit more. But you sit down, depending on the pasta, like you've already had like 30 to 50 pieces of this stuff. So a little oh, yeah. portion isn't a little portion. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Pasta <laughs> is like very co like calorically and carb dense, which there's nothing wrong with, but I yeah. want more. <laughs> and that doesn't happen. Uh. Uh, question from, question from Dan. Uh, have you ever had to deal with any negativity at the gym? Hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. I'd be lying if I said, you know, everybody there wants, um, Everybody there either wants to see you win or everybody there is just happy to see people working out. Um, here's what I will say, though. Never stop going because of other people. Because when I was 80 pounds heavier than I am now, people stared and made comments. When I was, you know, 20 pounds lighter than I am now, just like cardio bunny, lost all my weight but no muscle mass, people stared and made comments. And now, you know, I'm more muscular than the average girl and people still make comments and stare. You will never fit into everybody's mold of what they want to see. Mm -hmm. You will never, no matter where you are in the world, like find a place where people are just how they should be and just, yeah. yes. Yeah. You're, you're never going to find that. Um, so don't ever change, like just keep doing things for you because ultimately like that is what's going to bring you the most satisfaction and it takes practice. It's hard. It is really hard. It can be really hurtful, but once you start going and you shut it out, you won't even notice it eventually. And honestly, you'll start to have, um, empathy for those people because truly confident people, truly people who are happy with themselves, they're not the ones giving you negativity. They're not. So yeah. you can rest easy knowing those people are probably having a worse time living in their own head than, you know, what they're projecting onto you. Yeah. It's the people out there who want to knock someone else down instead of mm. lift themselves up. Yeah. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I heard a quote once and I'll never forget it. It's the best people that are below you are the only ones bringing, trying to bring you down because nobody truly either like however you define success or personal happiness or satisfaction, they don't do that because they know what it's like to be in a place where you're trying to better yourself and they're, they're either cheering you on or they're just happy to see you go. So, yeah. Yeah. One, one question that um, came to mind, and I generally like to ask something like this to anyone who is in the health, wellness, and fitness world, is what is the most common fitness or nutrition myth that you have come across that you just wish would just go away? Um, there's no such thing as starvation mode. There's really not. Uh, I, you know, there's, there's a few that instantly jump to mind, like, of course, the no carb thing. Mm. Um, you right. Like you don't have to cut carbs. Even if you have like PCOS, you don't have to cut carbs out completely. Um, that's a huge one, but yeah, there's no such thing as starvation mode. People love to throw this trigger word around. Um, and there's, I mean, sorry, there is such a thing as starvation mode, but not in the context that people think like you're not going to get there in the way that most fitness people are talking to you about. Um, you know, um, if, if that makes sense without going into like a super long thing. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, I get it. (laughs) Um, the only other thing I would say is, um, biggest misconception or hardest truth is, um, you might want to lose weight, but that doesn't mean you're ready to lose weight. Hmm. People have to remember, right? Like if you're eating 1300 calories, how do you expect to drop three to 500 calories if you're only eating 1300 now and still be successful. Right. Um, but yeah, those would probably be, I gave you three for one. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Where can people find you on social media and what's the easiest way for people to contact you if they want to get your advice? Yeah. So um, it, on Instagram, I'm on, under coach.frizzle. Literally, I'm pretty sure I spell it the same way as Miss Frizzle did. Or you can just think frizzy hair, but with an L-E. So coach, yeah, coach.frizzle on Instagram. On TikTok, I'm the same, but no dot in the middle. So just coach frizzle. You can message me on both platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, I am active on both platforms. So uh, like very regularly. So you can send me a private message or you can comment on one of my posts. But likewise, in both of my social media platforms, I do have a link to um my website slash email slash coaching questionnaire and i live on my phone so i i will see it uh and get back to you within 48 hours kind of thing perfect thank you so much for your time yeah no thanks so much for having me this is awesome i haven't done a podcast in a hot second so this was great